Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me, your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 446, 446 of the Agassino Zynga show, how you doing, how you feeling, wherever you may be, if it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, you know what to do, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below and if you're listening via the podcast app, a five star review um, as well as a share will help it to go a long way and of course support via Patreon is always more than welcome, you can support via Patreon at patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O to get access to a free bonus episode per week available only to Patreon subscribers so make sure you jump on there and get involved today anyway how's it going how you feeling good great amazing how am I you know same old same old bunged up feeling a little bit clogged up obviously in the front of my face with these bloody allergies and stuff but I'm getting there little by little um today is what Today is Champions League night, right? Champions League night, which is always a bit of a bittersweet evening uh, for me personally, of course, being a Manchester United fan. It's difficult to uh, watch these matches and see teams in the Champions League, knowing full well that we should be in there ourselves, but then also knowing that there's current administration in the Glazers and there's current coaching staff with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. It's most likely going to disappoint us season in, season out. So we just have to kind of see how other clubs are doing things and kind of hope that we are on that platform too. Pretty sobering, I have to be honest, as a United fan, because there were there were times in the past under Alex Ferguson where I think we might have taken the our European runs for granted. For sure, we should have won way more Champions League um, trophies than than the you know than two. I think we won this under Alex Ferguson and I'm pretty sure it was two. Um, we should have won way more Champions League trophies than that. Obviously, um, a lot of real near misses um, where we kind of paid for not really having an effective transfer policy in terms of replacing midfield players or evolving from the partnership of skulls and gigs in the midfield or over-reliance on people like Jason Park who maybe wasn't at the top, top, top level needed or wasn't at the level needed at the moment at that time anyway to get us all we wanted to get to but thinking about it now actually the players like Jason Parkman what we would give for a player like him in a currently United team um, people would say maybe Jesse Lingard's a kind of reincarnation the modern one of Jason Park but that level of player was like you know one of our players that we sort of looked at as you know a little bit less than and now we have players that have gone for a lot of money who probably shouldn't be playing anywhere near United in it. so same could be said for someone like a Fletcher that's another good example as well but you know we go where we go we go where we go um what else do i have to mention today that uh music wise i finally f- yeah mu- music wise so I-, I had this strange occurrence strange occurrence strange occurrence recently where i was finding it very difficult to upload and save songs on my itunes i guess something's happened within an update you know i'm running at the moment i've got a macbook so i'm running big sir at the moment and if it's basically been updated i had to replace the hard drive because it died on me um you know loads of stuff in between but i'm currently up to date in terms of operating software and i think somewhere between whenever i last backed up my um itunes account and whenever i reinstalled this hard drive there's been a new update in itunes which has basically meant that for some reason certain tracks when i play them on my laptop top they will skip so if i play an album um track one to two it won't go right to the end it will skip straight into track two which is you know no problem i guess because you still hear the songs but it's just annoying in terms of playback and then on other occasions stuff doesn't load up properly when i drag and drop it because i'm still old school in that way where i like to download some of my music and then kind of you know physically drag and drop it into my itunes library and then physically sync that back into my phone so there can be you know some sort sort of lossage and data spillage and all that malarkey can occur in certain points which is annoying don't get me wrong but i finally after a lot of effort managed to fix it and find an a route to kind of get it all back and synced up where it needed to be and of course it required some you know some really bog standard uh things to do which meant i had to essentially delete my entire library just keep the data files i guess on my um external hard drive and then kind of copy it back into the music um folder or library of my itunes that's what i basically had to do if you kind of understand that and it took it took like two days i think to do because i've got i've legitimately maybe what over five thousand songs or maybe more than that maybe ten thousand i'm not too sure somewhere within that range and it just took ages to complete but now we're finally finally there where i think my my um, library is kind of set up in a way where I can kind of, you know, get an idea of where everything is. The only problem is now when I go into my recent folders, when I kind of load up my iTunes library and I click the 
recently added tab it only shows obviously everything that i've downloaded recently in terms of dragging and dropping it from the date of when i last dragged and dropped it so i don't have that um benefit of seeing everything that i've added via month because obviously if the old itunes you could scroll down it shows you stuff you've added from six months ago so you can get a general idea of how your library is organized you can spot where things are so that's kind of difficult but you know um i'm just happy in general that i've got everything sorted but it's those tiny things that just you know you you wonder why this, i guess in terms of your tech company you have to keep innovating maybe you don't have to but it's sort of within your it's part of your dna and if you're a tech company you don't just keep making the same thing you have to try and maybe keep making the same thing by innovating it into you know for newer and better processes and all that malarkey but for the end user someone like myself it's not the best it really isn't it really kind of hurts your experience of it um, it makes it difficult to kind of keep up to date what's going on especially when you have certain uses for it i'd imagine if I'm, I'm sure there's certain people out there that still use mp3 players like you know ipods and whatever they may be and you're used to kind of organizing your music a certain way and then they update it which kind of takes away that ability um i know a lot of people kind of i know for myself i've sort of like transitioned completely over to record box in terms of organizing my dj stuff like i have a completely different hard drive that i use used to organize the music that i play when i go out and a completely different one i organize to have just for music for my ipod and shit and i'm sure there's some stuff in there that i should probably transfer over but for the most part it is kind of separate because some of the portability and features that were on the itunes prior have basically gone um over time and there's no going back unfortunately and they kind of you know whenever they slowly start phasing out certain features on an app especially apple you know the end is soon to come so you kind of have to either adapt to whatever's coming or move to something else that you're more comfortable with there's no going back because sooner or rather later even if you take off the ability to like you know update your app or whatever they're still going to find a way to kind of push that on your computer for sure because you know fair enough my hard drive died but part of me was thinking you know why did suddenly my hard drive die out of nowhere well, maybe because i did push my computer to the absolute limit but still there was a feeling that you know they they somehow get these little bugs um you know seeping through your computer in order to push you to update it which then forces you then to download a new os which then forces you to then download a new apps blah 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 so it's a bit of a circus but eventually i got it where it needs to be and you know as annoying as it can be you know having to spend extra money on having to get a new hard drive ram save all that download it follow the youtube videos it's just i'm thankful that that stuff exists you know what i mean like you can actually go on youtube and people much smarter than you or i who have a real passion for computers and you know people that you would most likely have to pay in any other walk of life or in any other time in history they're giving away tips and how to install things for free on the internet you just have to follow it step by step and it's similar to like a uh, cooking instructions to bake a cake as long as you just follow it from step one to step ten you're most likely going to have the same results just don't skip don't improvise because sometimes there is that tendency to do it because it's youtube you can sometimes want to skip ahead and be like oh, i don't need to learn that i don't need to do this that's nonsense it's exaggerating it's exaggerating but if you just stick to what they say more often than not you should kind of figure it out and this guy who i followed he kind of had three steps or three routes to kind of um you know get your library itunes library back to where it should be and i picked one of them that was applicable to me because the other four didn't work you kind of just go down you know s systematically boom 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 and whatever worked you kind of go from there and of course you do what everyone else do, does because just to kind of help the algorithm and just to give people confidence because i know for me it definitely helped when i was looking at videos and i'll scroll down to the comments and see people say oh yeah great thanks for this tip this really works for me i've been without my computer for a month and it finally came back to life i'm so thankful you saved me money and then people you know you get the same sort of reviews so usually when i do this when i have the same sort of experience i like to kind of get back in the same way just to kind of add to that level of you know support with the reviews and stuff because they it, it, it really shouldn't go a long way because the video should be enough for you and the dislike part should tell you whether it's informative but seeing people in the comments you know really excited about their laptops or computers coming back to life because they've been come across this really amazing video from some kid you know that they recorded it on his flipping iphone it's just definitely helped so that was cool and um what else boom, 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 boom. um well yeah season two of battles are galactica I've, i'm about halfway through at the moment i gotta be honest i'm a little bit um the, the storyline with the cylons and you know and the whole idea behind uh the humans falling in love with certain silence and that being the main precursor as to why 
um humanity is still you know surviving after maybe the destruction of earth and all this sort of stuff i'm getting a little bit tired of it i have to be honest i'm getting a little bit tired of this weird trope of like humans falling in love with machines i guess there's there's some there is some credence to it when you look at how people are with their phones and with their laptops you know i know how i am with my stuff and how people are in general with their tech um people that stream and stuff you know on a daily daily on a daily basis right um the people that they speak to online or in that virtual space are probably more real to them than anybody they kind of speak to day to day because you're spending what that is at least eight hours per day talking to these people right it's a lot of time um that you're investing in it um there's a lot of emotions tied into it late at night intoxicated high whatever it may be but i think this idea that in the future we're going to have you know live in a world where humans will be corrupted by um forces unbeknownst to them that live within or that dwell within these um ais or robots and stuff it's a little bit weird especially um when it comes to a romantic thing right when it's a thing of like oh this person is going to maybe forego his family or forego loyalty to his country or to his fellow troops in order to you know um in order to what uh, impregnate a robot and raise their half man half robot baby it's just a bit baffling to me in that regard um the series is a bit strange it goes on a bit of a tangent in that way but i guess it's one of those early 2000 tropes where you know they always have to kind of imbue a lot of like romantic drama um into these sort of series to make them compelling i guess for a wider audience i'm sure after the first season when all the ratings hit they went to then reach more people so they just sprinkled in some love storyline but i'm getting a little bit bored of that whole thing maybe it's a common thing in sci-fi which i'm not really familiar with but i don't know um usually it's always about space politics um there is some love involved but this is kind of getting a bit over the top with the whole falling in love with robots thing but still despite that it's still a solid solid series easily you know way better than anything i've seen on netflix recently especially when you think of stuff like star trek discovery with you know like that's one of the most infuriating tv series i've ever watched in a while i was glad as well that i finally decided to kind of double check on youtube and click some reviews and see what other people are saying because i thought i was the only one i thought it was only me that kind of felt as if like this is a bit this is getting a little bit ridiculous why is this michael burnham character always um the center of any everything like why does everything seem to revolve around this one character why is she incapable of making mistakes or um facing the consequences of her errors and um, why does everything seem to kind of bend and coerce to her will like it just seemed a little bit bizarre that, as a, of a storyline to kind of really get invested in and then finally i found people on youtube who kind of had the same sort of thing and it kind of led me down this ra rabbit hole with the fandom menace and all these other um real um invested geeks who are like really annoyed that disney has basically turned some of their beloved franchises and whatever it may be into basically vessels for modern day politics right to kind of further an agenda wherever it may be and it's disappointing to see because i guess a lot of those things from what i've seen so far the source material there's a lot of really cool interesting politics um and kind of societal views in there that could be co-opted and maybe you know uh, reinterpreted in a modern light easily without having to force down without having to really kind of shoehorn in loads of racial and um identity politics sort of nonsense right you can do it there's a lot in there especially when you think of you know the amount of aliens and stuff that exists in those kind of universes and people from different nationalities and different planets whatever it may be right just from all over the universe there is ways that you can kind of make that more interesting without making it super super obvious and i guess with this michael burnham character they try to go overboard and essentially they made a character who's basically impervious to any sort of mistake or errors and basically goes through the entire series of star trek discovery just doing whatever the fuck she wants right at any time and it kind of never upsets it, it kind of so it upsets the storyline but then it always sort of works out for that main character it's a really strange one um to kind of get wrap my head around and it's annoying too because there's a lot of really good you know i watch it for a lot of the escapism in terms of seeing you know computer you know um the cgi spaceships and stuff and fights and what they're not there's something just quite cool about that right just being a bit of a geek in that regard and loving um anything to do with space and you know um uh spaceships and all that sort of nonsense and you know being obsessed with stuff that lee Lomond is doing with uh, spacex whatever it may be it's nice to see it but when you actually get down to the actual story line itself and how it's written like you know the the, the, the 
the, the chasm between Battlestar Galactica and Star Trek Discovery is just insane, right? Insane, really, really insane. Like expert writing, on, and again, Battlestar Galactica isn't like amazing, amazing, but it's still super, super ahead of anything that I've seen recently in any of those kind of main digital streaming platforms. So you know, it is what it is, I guess. But I could definitely understand why a lot of those guys within that fandom menace are annoyed, especially if you imagine I'm just I've just picked up on this, and you know, the last few years. Imagine if this was your entire life and you've been obsessed with everything to do with Lucasfilm and star wars and star trek and whatever it may be from when you're an infant and then you've slowly you slowly you slowly seen your the thing that you loved you know die a slow but sure death in the hands of people who quite clearly are using it for their own political um you know and career gains and not using it in terms of maybe furthering the story adding to the legacy bloody blah, blah coming for it from fans they're just seeing it as another way to grift and um essentially that's what it turned into and it's turned into one big grift machine and people are out here you know driving these representation represent representation drives or whatever nonsense it is it's just it's just bizarre to me and it's all make-believe really isn't it it's sci-fi it's fantasy none of this stuff is real to imbued um, representation politics and identity politics and it just doesn't make any sense personally um and even if it does and there is a question for it just make your own thing up in it i don't see the reason and the point of ruining legacy products just to fit in just to fit in your own you know narrative and shit just go and make your own thing like it's no big deal really anyone can do it um for the most part most of these pl streaming platforms are willing and ready to throw a checkbook at you you just have to make it compelling enough that normal people that don't give a fuck about the puzzles will watch it too that's the tricky part Right. Once you get money or check from Hulu or Netflix to make your woke drama, it's all well and good. You can make it, but you suddenly have to now find a way of appealing to the people who care about those kind of politics, and then the regular everyday folk who just want to watch something cool and interesting, which is a you know very difficult task um, to figure out. And so far, not a lot of people have basically figured it out. With if you believe the whole mantra of go work, go broke. But yeah, um, so far, Star Trek Galactica, or Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica Season 2 has been very, very impressive for me. Um, okay, what else we got to talk about? Oh yeah, yeah, let's move on to this actually. This is a important update actually. Important and not so important, but this is courtesy of the Joe Biden podcast subreddit. So someone posted a screenshot from this lady called I Heart Miko, who I'm not, if I'm not uh mistaken is the wife of a very prominent nfl player if not former again not american so i have no idea what goes on there but she's very clued in and locked into the whole like new york um podcasting and comedy and entertainment scene knows a lot of the people in the jbp um podcast of course and loads of other people on the brilliant idiot side of things um in terms of Schultz and charlemagne so she's clued up on what's going on and she posted this um on her story which is the following and it says um this is a screenshot from her instagram page and it says fyi this is from the town magazine and it says um the caption uh, above a underneath a picture of marl and rory says well, hashtag word in the town is that the real reason marl and rory left and dot 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 and then miko added on her post i heard this as well more on the, uh, i heard this and more as well so this is basically coming from the horse's mouth somebody directly tied in with that whole camp who's now talking um openly about the issues that have basically been occurring behind the scenes and i think for a lot of people who have invested in this flipping stupid podcast drama that really we shouldn't be caring about but we are caring about because we all have nothing better to do um this is basically uh confirming a lot of the suspicions that a lot of us had you know behind the scenes or not well, a lot of us had away from the show where we kind of speak about stuff you know whether it's a discord or reddit or whatever maybe everyone's kind of been having the same idea where we basically surmise that it's definitely about money but of course the dudes on the podcast are telling you no it's not especially joe specifically joe and i think parks as well he mentioned a few times that it's definitely not the money thing but we know from you know whatever else we've seen in the media space when it comes to disagreements in the camp it's usually always about money especially when it can involve friends there's no other thing that will really drive somebody to you know to take a leave of absence or go and strike if it wasn't something to do with some sort of monetary thing so anyway the post itself on this instagram page called the town said the following word in town is that the real reason marlon rory left of job on podcast was because they asked to see the finances and of the show and Joe Biden refused, stating that it was his show and not theirs, which caused a deep rift between the co-hosts. Adding to the drama, Joe told Rory it was best if he took time off on the show, which caused some crew members um, 
which uh what's that which caused the to, to take of some show from the show which some crew members saw as rory getting suspended from the popular podcast trouble has been brewing since last year when budden decided to leave a multi-billion multi-million they wish multi-million dollar spotify day on the table to go independent sources close to more than rory say the duo have been getting offers to start their own podcast since leaving the show stay tuned as we update the story hashtag the town so very very interesting right and maybe a clear indication if ever there was one that it's probably over for them um, and i only say this because of my small experience i've had with doing business with friends and how that can go very south very quickly when money is involved and there's not a clear line of communication and you have different goals and objectives and what you want to do it's very difficult to kind of get that back especially as well to be added to it so when kind of there's a lot of time that passes in between you got talking as as often and other people then get involved and kind of talk into your ear and distract the person and kind of feed them a false narrative or make it seem like you're doing something whatever it may be it, 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 it could just drive a wedge that sort of time that silence those gaps in between time can drive a wedge and basically make it to a point where there is no option or no chance of things being reconciled and being brought back to a place where you can work back together again it's very difficult to do so because part of the reason why and part of the joy of working with friends is that you're that your friends and that you're in business with right the moment it turns into um just a job and just an occupation the magic that kind of existed prior basically goes now don't get me wrong the magic doesn't stay forever right that little stardust that kind of is sprinkled on this show because they're all very good close friends and they know intimate details about each other can only go so far but it's still there it's still you know maybe it starts off at like 100 percent of that friendship stardust and then as time goes on it kind of diminishes little by little but you still have a, some bits on there so maybe by now it may be 20 10 percent, but it's still enough to basically differentiate their show from many others that's, that's why i think people need to realize too um what they were doing wasn't that unique but what made it unique was the chemistry between the three of them right um even the four of them when you include parks or the other people with some down that aren't even on the mic at all right and then once you kind of that magic is gone and they're just there because they want to get a check and they don't you know they do that thing of um who's that NF nba player that turned up at the press conference is like oh i'm only here so i don't get fined right um when it turns to that sort of thing it's gone and you might as well just call it quits and move your separate ways but the i guess the only frustrating part about this if you're a fan is that they kept insisting that it wasn't about money right and they kept telling us that they were going to be transparent about the issues without being transparent every show that i've watched so far i've, I've missed the last two don't get me wrong but the, the last one i watched from then it was basically joe doing a lot of semantics and talking in riddles and going around things which i understand right you don't want to put someone else's business out there but there should be an acknowledgement that there's you know they've prided their entire show on being you know open oh no say up they've kind of built a show complete they've kind of built a show off the back of dissecting a lot of deals that happen within industry hip-hop and stuff and in the moment it comes to them and it's sort of the light is shown the light is sort of pointed in their direction they kind of you know push back from divulging too many details because they're afraid of how it might make them look which again isn't very much isn't um isn't the best thing for fans when it comes to kind of getting clarity into what's going on but from what we can read between the lines and you know the little sub tweets that Mal's been sending out and posts from Roy and Malarkey and the tension that obviously existed prior to them breaking up it was clear from day that it was definitely a money issue there was no other thing that would be now whether or not the details that we have we've been kind of rumored that kind of speaking about are true is another thing um I'm still not very I'm still not sold on the idea that it was what Spotify think. I think even at the time, if you remember, a lot of the guys when they were discussing the Spotify deal and how negotiation broke down, a lot of them were happy with the fact that Joe didn't take that deal. I think they didn't really think it was worth it, right? It didn't really value them correctly. If you believe the numbers, 30 million for everything that Joe Budden podcast network owns and operates with, right? Their entire intellectual property, whatever it may be, um, all the shows that he did under that umbrella um, for however long, was it five years? I don't know, whatever long it much was, right? But it didn't work. The numbers didn't make sense at that time. And there was still a possibility that they were going to go on tour. I think that was around the same time they were about to announce a big tour. This was just before COVID, maybe a year before COVID, I forgot when it was. But I do remember that show and there was a lot of, if I remember correctly, they were very, uh, they, they all were in agreement that this was probably the wrong move to make at that time definitely for sure at that time so you there's to come to sort of circle back now in a you know in a in a 
you know, in a sort of post-COVID world and regret that he didn't take that deal is a little bit armchair, you know, quarterback sort of revisionist history. So that wasn't that wouldn't be fair on Joe in that regard. But for sure, maybe since then, in terms of clear communications of how the business is being conducted, um, what deals are on the table, that whole conversation that Joe had with um, Swiss Beats on the phone, or was it Swiss Beats or one of them, where he basically sort of said in a jokey, non-jokey way that he had a call with Triller, they said name his price and he hung up the phone, I'm not sure if that actually happened, or if he's just kind of exaggerating to make it a funny story, and then seeing how you know Rory's face was, obviously we know you know from what we know so far with Rory he's going through whatever he's going through at home stresses in that regard you know his earning potential has been kind of I'd assumed really affected due to COVID no live shows the the acts that he manages or the music consultation stuff is probably dried up Miles is probably doing the same sort of thing I don't know what he does in terms of running around with basketball players and stuff but I'm sure whatever he was doing consulting managing just being somebody that's got the ears to the street that's been affected too so for sure that could bring some strains and then when you start asking questions and you're not getting the right answers in terms of looking at the financial so you can maybe spec out and plan your finances and see where you need to make some sacrifices where you might need to do a little bit of a move I can get why that can definitely splinter the group and get it to the point where it's at now. The only problem I have with the whole, this, this entire thing is how surprising it is to learn that Joe basically refers to the podcast as his. He doesn't really treat it as something that he owns in partnership with his friends, which is bizarre when you think that the whole appeal of the show isn't just for Joe, it's for the dynamic that he has with everybody else because we got to know him singularly 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 whatever that word is um via his own career in hip-hop and obviously via his own little stints in reality tv um and then we got to see how crazy and you know uh, you know off kilter he was and then a lot of people would always wonder in it how does this guy have friends that's what i would think uh, that's how i kind of came to be a fan of the show and then you kind of see him on the show with, the, with these other guys who have known him for 10 plus years like oh okay this is how his friends manage him and he's the same and it kind of brought out a a kind of he kind of brought him in a better light let's say that um so to suggest that the podcast only centers around him is really insane but also in that respect why did the guys allow it to go this far where it was unknown or it was not clear who owned the actual show itself that's the only thing that i'm really questioning why were they under the impression that they had partnership and when they didn't and um why did why didn't joe make it maybe super clear that they were his employees i still don't agree with it i think it's super scummy like i mentioned a few other times i think there is accounts of um it's very it's kind of like an open secret within a startup world that Mark Zuckerberg isn't the nicest of humans in the world, right? But he still found a way to make sure that he gave the early employees of Facebook, maybe it was the only way he could do it because he couldn't actually pay them with money, but they all, all own shares, right, of the, of the company. And I think if you remember correctly, David Cho, is that his name? The street artist, he was um, commissioned to do a mural inside one of the original Facebook offices and they couldn't pay him, so they gave him shares in the company. And of course, then when they went to IPO, he cashed out you know for, to the tens of millions so he was able to do that with his employees and people that just painted the wall so for joe not be able to kind of break off his friends and give them a portion of the network of the show and have them involved in the negotiation process is just really bizarre i don't really see how that makes any sense i never really understood um the reason or the need to change the name as well of the show from our name this podcast later to joe brother podcast i've always thought that was strange and then for it to then go to be in a thing where all the negotiations for the show and all for sponsorships and whatnot and brand deals are always done via Ian and which is who happened to be Joe's manager was really odd to why the other lawyers for the other dudes or business managers weren't involved in those conversations too was very bizarre maybe it would be a bit too many chefs in the kitchen but why they weren't involved in that conversation and why it always felt like they were learning about deals and negotiations on the show itself it just came seemed a bit odd but if if I would hazard a guess I would say it's pretty much over for the JB for the Joe Biden podcast for now with the, with that original crew he's probably going to have to evolve it which he has already has with the introduction of Ice and Ish and from what I've seen so far in the comments and the dislike bars and so people are seeming to enjoy it little by little obviously it will naturally come to an end the same way it did with these guys because if Joe can fall out with these dudes he can fall out with anybody as he's proved over the course of his career but we just see it with how this kind of falls and pans out going forward um, there's rumours of supposedly of course as I mentioned in the article um, Rory and Moore having their own show 
I'm not too sure how interested I will be in that to be honest same way I'm not that interested in Joe show on his own I quite like the dynamic as a free we'll see in it how this show how it kind of pans out for the future but let me know what you think in the comments down below do you reckon there is a future still for Rory and Mo on the show or do you think it's done and do you think Joe Budden is out of order for not giving his friends a bit of the network itself or is this just a standard business deal let me know in the comments down below okay what else do we have here next we have this really funny <laughs> article well kind of funny article here unless you well not funny if you're hunter biden himself you would have known hunter biden uh joe biden's son got involved in a little bit of a got involved in a little bit of a situation um was it last year where he where he's one of his laptops that was handed into a repair shop somewhere was broken and hacked into and very disparaging pictures of himself cracked out you know just live in the vida loca in a random motel room somewhere with a random unidentified woman um was spread all across the interwebs for a long period of time you know the obviously the Biden administration was trying to make it into like a russian collusion thing when it was just in fact you know his son was being sloppy and it turned into a whole affair and then from the back of that you know as a great way to kind of capitalize and um seize on the moment i don't know why this happened but somehow within the process of that happening and now hunter biden went into rehab got a book deal somehow and published in a sort of memoir autobiography where he kind of details i guess his upbringing um within the biden family and the struggles that like he's faced with addiction and stuff and it's just you know it's typical american stuff isn't it there's always an opportunity wherever there's an opportunity to make some money um and to insert yourself into the narrative and to go to rewrite the narrative in your favor um they'll do it and this is a headline here from the new york post i guess is an excerpt from the book it says hunter biden says he probably smoked uh, uh <laughs> parmesan cheese digging for crack in the carpets like that's anyone has had anyone has been in an extensive session will know how dark it can get sometimes when you're trying to um keep the party going let's say so definitely feel his pain on that one but just imagine that man parmesan cheese in the cut in a carpet that you're mistaking for crack yeah yeah yeah. so it continues it says here hunter biden recalled how he used to scra scrounge through the carpet looking for crack cocaine after getting high saying he probably wound up smoking parmesan cheese he said i spent more time on my hands and knees picking through rugs smoking anything that even remotely resembled crack cocaine i probably smoked more than parmesan cheese than anyone president's son said on cbs good morning um i went uh, one time for 13 days without sleeping 13 days bruv do you know how high you have to be to be high for 13 days and to keep chasing it that's one of the that's when i wonder really in the future if that's even going to be a thing could we even see us could we see a future where scientists are able to biohack um recreational drugs and kind of take away that element where you kind of want to chase the dragon and you kind of want to chase that first high because obviously you can never get it i think that's why a lot of heroin users say people should be very dubious or careful and resistant to not take heroin because supposedly the high from heroin is probably one of the best people say to take recreational drugs and you end up just trying to chase that first two or three hits and you end up in a you know in a, in a spiral that eventually leads to you losing your home and you know just you know becoming desolate but I wonder if in the future there is a there is a possibility where scientists can hack those drugs and make it so that they're not as Moorish, right? And they don't kind of what and they don't basically require you to just stay up for hours on end because as damaging as alcohol is, there's only so much you can drink within a day, right? Because you have to sleep. Um, it just is what it is. Um, whether it's the compounds that are involved in alcohol, whatever it may be, it's obviously more damaging because I guess the effects of it um you know aren't immediate but can be felt for years on right later on down the line and it's something as well that i've read too that's very hard to break right being um you know an alcoholic in that regard that addiction to that drink is very difficult to break especially if your circle social circle surrounds itself in drinking and going out whatnot but i wonder if that's possibly to be done and if that would basically just you know uh, spell a completely different dawn and age in terms of drug users if they kind of all um are in agreement and are safe enough in the knowledge knowing that oh if i keep chasing this drug i'm not going to stay up for 13 days it's going to be a little buzz i get for an hour i wonder but this is mad isn't it? it says i went over um continuously i went one time for 13 days without sleeping and smoking crack and drinking vodka throughout the entire time he said during an interview to promote his memoir beautiful things out april 6 on the gallery books uh, he says there he says um an imprint from simon and schuster so imagine you got a big that's why sometimes you wonder in it when people say 
oh, I don't want to say white privilege. When people say white privilege doesn't exist, you have to just sometimes wonder this sort of thing, right? What who, who what what other former crackhead do you know gets the ability to you know write a I'm guessing multi million dollar autobiography memoir um, with Simon and Schuster um, off at the back of their you know drug abuse being leaked to the millions and millions of people, their dad being a politician, right? So you'd imagine that in in times gone by if that kind of if those images were leaked um you know and it were and it centered around and it was the son of a potential candidate for the presidency of the united states it would m more likely than not torpedo their election process or their election hopes but this time around it kind of you know didn't make a dent because of course Biden was competing against trump and everyone was like orange man bad and it also pro um significantly uh, benefited the family in general because they were able to write this amazing redemption story arc where this guy went to rehab came back out was clean and is able to kind of look at it from a you know from a kind of bird's eye view distance if you know it only happened 16 months ago or whatever it may be crazy he said um continue to he said uh, the then vice president dad tried to intervene after he began binge drinking vodka following the death of his brother Bu biden in 2015 he said he came to my apartment one time and this was when we were still in the office as vice president and so he kind of ditched his secret service figured out a way to get over to the house um and then i said what are you going to do? what are you doing here he said honey what are you doing here i said dad i'm fine he said you're not fine hunter later teared up an in interview trying uh, saying that his dad calls him every night we took at least every night by the way not only does he talk to me every night he calls one of my daughters and he talks to each of them every day and i know that he talks to me and i know that he talks to my sister and say what you want about biden right he might be mentally incapacitated and whatever not but the one thing you did see throughout that entire process he was very protective of his children and his family he didn't really lean into or buy into the you know the narrative that was going out there in the media he tried to be as respectful and as professional about dealing with it in the public as he could and you know um, i guess in that respect you would definitely get to see some of the evidence there with some of the stuff that hunter biden is saying but it's just incredible isn't it that they're able to basically pivot and sort of use this entire situation as, as an opportunity to show the family in a good light, which I guess is what he owes them, right? For the hell he put them through, because I could just imagine how frantic they must have been as a family, you know, just on the cusp of achieving glory and being elected into the White House. And then, bam, these, you know, uns you know unscrupulous images of their son is getting plastered all over the Internet you know for sure there's a lot of resentment there a lot of anger frustration whatnot it may be but they were able to collect themselves like a true professional political family does and basically get to a situation like this isn't it where where um hunter biden is basically profiting off of his crack addiction and he's going on a speaking tour about how great his father is which again makes his dad look amazing in it so a really clever um way to spin the entire narrative from that entire family all together and again maybe it's for the best and it will help some people going forward but hey stranger things have happened next on the list da, 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 we have some interesting news from germany regarding the president making a rare national appeal man covid yeah like who would have guessed it right who would have guessed it at the beginning of last year or beginning of no, the middle of last year that somehow england would be in a position where we're on the cusp of reopening most of the hospitality industry fans are going to be allowed back into stadiums a blight with a supposed covid passport and places like germany are still struggling right um places like france are in another lockdown belgium really suffering like places in europe that were doing really well last year and that were you know i remember seeing images and pictures of um places in paris open and streets overflowing with tables and chairs um because people were dining outside and all that malarkey right and now we're in a position where suddenly the uk is the place to be and places in continental europe are just struggling and on their knees and there's no really great example of it than germany itself and um again uh, what you call it praise and thoughts with all my german brothers and sisters out there who are struggling at the moment because for sure it's definitely a bleak time so this is from dw it says german president makes a rare national plea and covid pandemic it says um, germans should stick together and overcome the current 
crisis of trust in the government president frank walter steinminer says so as the following it says in the easter televised um address on saturday german president frank walter steinmeiser steinminer or steinmeier steinmeier yeah um our germans to remain united and overcome a crisis of trust in the government and the country battles this ferocious third wave of the coronavirus such speeches um to the nation are rare and though the germany prim prim primarily ceremonial head of state um, has many engagements at the home and abroad Steinmeier usually uh, only makes tele such televised appearances in Christmas German satisfaction in the government including its handling of the pandemic has fallen dramatically so that you know why he's talking to them it continues Germany's slow vaccination rollout lack of political unity and exemplified by the German Chancellor Angela Merkel's backtrack on the east of the lockdown and unclear coronavirus restrictions have all come under fire says the following uh, people increasingly feel trusted feel frustrated and helpless giving rise to a crisis of trust in a country the president told germans he said trust in a democracy this rests on a very fragile agreement between the people and their state you the state do your part and i the citizen will do mine steinmeier said he said the crisis an additional burden besides the concerns about health school and work and the economy topics that have dominated german political debate on how to handle the coronavirus pandemic you see him there looking like a real um, German president there, right? Continues um, acknowledging that the Germany have made mistakes when it comes to testing and vaccination to digital solutions. He recognized a public way to say to their leaders, pull yourselves together. He said there is, of course, no other silver bullet to end the pandemic. And that is why we need political debate. But this debate must not become an end of itself. Federal or state government, party or coalition, what direction the polls are sliding up or down in the polls, these reconciliations three considerations must not take center stage we need clarity and resolve and we need transparent and pragmatic rules so that people know where they stand so that this country can once again draw on all the potential which it possesses the president has also while his criticism is valid he said it's not enough we must all put together we uh, my dear german fellows we must give it everything we've got so a very rousing and encouraging speech probably a lot more um motivating and inspiring than what angela Merkel had to say continues here there are no there is no use merely being out, outraged by what others or by our leaders rather than uh, constantly pointing out what that doesn't work we should point out the things that do work when everyone does their bit this is what I'm talking about when I talk about trust because ultimately trusting in democracy means nothing other than trusting in ourselves uh, Steinmeier extended his message of trust to every single vaccine approved in Germany he added vaccinations is the most crucial step to our path to the pandemic so take advantage of it the president received his first dose of AstraZeneca developed vaccine on Thursday the vaccine has been the center of concerns over the unusual blood clots despite repeated assurance from the european medical agency and the who he pointed out to the vaccines as a sign of the progress made to which uh with scrums developed or sorry with serums developed in second in the record time including quite notably in germany so a very rousing speech from everybody involved and there's a picture of, of steinmeier getting his vaccine itself and again it's going to be a bleak summer in it for germans going forward pretty much it looks like if they do get things back under control there is a possibility that things could go back to some semblance of normality maybe by the end of summer i'm guessing the beginning of winter maybe right around that sort of time i can see it opening up again um but it's gonna be very difficult to kind of see it turning around and very quickly especially amidst a third wave that's currently hitting them and especially with the amount of people that are going to be traveling throughout the summer in Europe, because for sure that this is the thing as well that kind of hurts a lot of people in Europe. I think a lot of people that were kind of well behaved last year, myself included, who kind of didn't get a chance to have a European holiday or go and you know have some time away from their home country, are definitely going to take advantage of maybe getting the vaccine themselves skipping a the line or just going in general and paying for the test and just you know because there's a lot of money when you go on a trip these days if you don't get the vaccine you still have to prove that you're negative which requires you have to you know buy the vaccine the test yourself or ahead of time you have to get one before you go before you come back so that's two on either side so that kind of already adds about 300 to 400 quid on your price of your ticket so it's going to limit the people that are able to go but if you're able to go a lot as i envisaged a lot of people deciding 
looking to head out and you know spend summers somewhere else and that's going to definitely um hinder and negatively affect some countries that are struggling to kind of get a grip on the on the virus itself so it's definitely going to be a long summer for a lot of people in europe so definitely hold on tight wherever you may be and just kind of i don't know i'm just hoping for the best and i'm hoping that you guys work it out and you're able to kind of get back to some semblance of normality because it does feel a bit unfair that we've some, somehow got into a position in the uk where we are basically on the cusp of returning to some semblance of normality when we haven't really done that well in terms of abiding by the rules uh except for really staying indoors because it's cold in it really which is quite a lot again we have to just just being thankful for the circumstances that we with which we exist in if the uk was you know, a sunnier place to live in um this would have been hell right it would have been horrendous like if this was a completely different culture in terms of you know going outdoors and eating with friends and family and drinks or whatever it would have been different people obviously first in for it now but we haven't got the sort of like you know outdoorsy life that you kind of um associate with places in the mediterranean for instance so it kind of makes it a bit easier to stay indoors right people especially in london people tend to just kind of keep themselves to themselves but imagine if we have that we had a sprinkling of that sort of like um you know way of living in the uk and the weather was good it would be there'll be bodies all over the place because you know we, we we already can't be trusted with a little bit of freedom and a little bit of sun it, we already go crazy so imagine if we had that already but yeah i'm thankful for it regardless and then this is from dw it's another list here of some countries and how they're dealing with it it's pretty cool and little teddy bears outside this um restaurant in france so it says how other countries are dealing with it so you've got germany's got a u-turn and a quiet easter you've got france are heading into a third lockdown which is wild um spain mask manager on the beach which is insane to be honest in my opinion wearing a mask on the beach is just an utterly bizarre and useless thing to do all in all portugal is starting to open up you got greece has a good reason needed to go out too so strict rules in greece will continue to apply nationwide until at least the 5th of april people are allowed to leave their homes between 5 a.m and 9 p.m but only if they have a good reason to do so um, such as doctor's appointments to exercise or to go to work or to take the dog for a walk bulgaria outdoor lunches czech republic only two people are allowed to meet they're really hurting over there sweden comparatively relaxed it's since the start of the pandemic sweden and every countries have pursued a more liberal course it's issued a lot of instructions telling people that what they should do but kept the ban's prohibition to a minimum it says the following however since the start of january this year the government has been clamping down a little bit more it has passed a new set of measures to tackle the pandemic but in the comparison to the other eu countries these are mild a maximum of four are allowed to sit at a single table in a restaurant up to eight people are allowed to meet shops and tourists and accommodation remain open so everything's as per usual there but yeah man it's a bit it's a bit mad over in europe everything's there's a lot of there's a lot of places that are open and not open and kind of you know landlocked areas of course neighboring countries so it's going to be a bit crazy in the summer so definitely hold on tight wherever you may be hold on tight what else do we have here da, 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 da. <laughs> Oh yeah, we have this really interesting story. So I guess over the weekend, there was a game between Valencia and Cadiz. And somehow within the process of the game, um, a Cadiz player referred to one of the Valencia defenders as a monkey or something black, whatever it may be. You know, the standard insults that these uh, people within the continent use against black players when on the pitch when they feel like they need to get under their skin. And what's transpired since then has been nothing short of extraordinary in terms of how uh, people in football have been talking about it, how the the how the alleged accuser has been kind of addressing it, um, the response to the victim. It's just been a very confusing and very illuminating um, kind of view into how race is dealt with in Europe as opposed to how it's dealt with, or racism, how it's dealt with in Europe in as opposed to how it's dealt with in America. Because for sure, if this happened in America, like this wouldn't run, right? People would be kicking up a complete fuss and kerfuffle. But for the most part, people are kind of, I'm not going to say desensitized to it, but they're somewhat desensitized to it. And the reaction to it has been met with some level of skepticism, which is bizarre when you can quite clearly hear the guy saying what he's been accused of saying uh, via the mics because there's no one in the stadiums, right? 
Um, so this is courtesy of an um, account called um, Colin Miller. And I forget he's a journalist that's based in Spain. And he says the following, Valencia players have walked off the pitch against Cadiz due to what appears to be an alleged racist comment against defender uh, Mukhtar Diakabi. It says the comment and the argument was sparked by the comment from Cadiz's Juan Cala. Cadiz's players have now also exited the pitch, game postponed in 36 minutes. Valencia players are instantly show solidarity with Diakabi by walking off the pitch. This is the incident. And of course, there's a video I'm not going to play because I don't want to get nipped off the YouTube. It continues. It looks like the game will be restarted without the Akabi. This is not a good look. And allegedly what happened, they went, they kind of stormed out. They, the Akabi walks off the pitch. The Valencia players walk off the pitch with him in solidarity. Obviously, the game has to be paused. And then in the changing room, the 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 referee t lets um, Valencia know that if they forfeit the game, they're going to forfeit the three points, which is understandable. There's no real rule in place at the moment now with football when it comes to racial abuse, which obviously needs to change. But for the most part if a team decides to walk off the pitch they forfeit the game so then the team have to decide whether or not they're willing to give up the three points to stand with their teammate or go back on the pitch without their teammate and fight for whatever they have to fight for they can't be like a gentleman and like a soldier that he is decides to, to give his teammates a permission to go back on the pitch and fight for him but he just won't play which is bizarre considering he was the one that's a victim he was the guy that's a victim of the racial abuse the players come back out again and it continues here says the game is now starting the Akabi who now appears to be suffered a very serious abuse is substitute off John Keller who made the alleged comment stays on the pitch which is maddening Valencia reaffirmed their players are against racism unfortunately the victim of racist abuse does not continue to play this game it says here yeah, as you can imagine very little information is being communicated we continue it develops obviously you've got the dry and color guy there um here's a report that claims Valencia players return to the pitch as they thought they would be punished for failing to complete the game um it continues here let's go the, 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 it's got whole updates here what, the, the most interesting bit is the actual case itself right because we know what they're going to say in spain and because this is a country where they throw bananas at you if you're black and it's get under your skin supposedly and it continues um Da, 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 da. what else is it uh, it says a drunk color the Cadiz player who allegedly used the, this word as he does not appear in any video to have racial abuse it says in this country it seems like no longer we have a presumption of innocence so he's obviously fighting for his innocence and saying that he didn't say the thing that he said to this morning Valencia president and Neil Mutri held talks with La Liga and pushing for clarification of what happened and future protocol for similar incidences officials at Valencia are concerned by a state of mind following the episode um, it says here we carried out an internal procedure it's clear from the reaction of Valencia player that something has happened from La Liga we condemned any act of racism and will act against it um, it continues and then yeah so this is the actual the overheard audio of him actually saying whatever he was meant to be accused of saying <laughs> You can obviously hear him saying you'd have to kind of have no, no that much Spanish to hear it. He says, Yeah, I've rewatched the footage and the racial insult appears to be picked up by TV microphones at eight. Uh, you hear him say, um, Ar Arbitro, a referee, and you hear him say, You appear him say, Negro de mierda, of course, which is, you know, not the best thing to hear someone saying. And then, you know, you have this flipping super sad video of the kid himself, very, very young, you know, when you actually see the kid. Um, in the video playing football he looks much older than what he actually looks like when he's standing in front of the camera you know in, I would not say innocence ripped from him but it's definitely a sobering experience to be like a professional football player multi-millionaire playing you know the game that you love and then having to suffer racial abuse from another fellow player fair enough if you're going to you know the depths of flipping eastern and central Europe you know what you're going to get when you go to those places but to be in a pitch with your other fellow professionals who are doing the same thing you're doing in the same, same country and then to be subjected to that abuse is just insane and obviously he gives a statement. Hola, quiero hablar de lo que pasó en, en Cádiz el domingo. Bueno, después de dos días, soy muy tranquilo y, y quiero hablar. En, en Cádiz, el domingo, hay una jugada donde un jugador me insulta y las palabras son negro de mierda. El jugador me diga eso. Y eso es intolerable. Yo no puedo cocinar eso y, y bueno, habéis visto todas mis, mis reacciones y, 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 y bueno, eso... 
Really continue for a little bit. He says, yeah, can it spare one? And he's now, and this is now we we're fast forwarding to today where he gave a press conference, which is the wild bit, right? So it says, yeah, can this player, Juan Carlos, is giving his press conference, keeps repeating that there is absolutely no racism in Spanish football, denies all allegations and calls the situation a circus. So very interesting approach to being accused of racism, having evidence that you actually said the thing, players coming out and supporting their you know, friend is a victim of it. The victim himself is detailing exactly what you said and the microphone's picking up exactly what you said on the pitch and then you're now calling it a circus. Very interesting way to approach it. It says the following, Duran Carlos seemingly denying he said anything to Diakabi at all other than leave me alone. Does not appear to be suggesting that he used any other sort of insult or slur and that there is a reasonable possibility of misinterpretation. Duran Carlos is now saying that he has received messages of support from all races, including Chinese, African and persons of color. He has that he has many black friends and former teammates. The, 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 that's the classic line you hear people say whenever they've been accused of such thing. Um, Keller also claiming that he has co commencing legal action against anyone who slandered him publicly, which is kind of the height of gaslighting, right? You've been accused of something heinous and then now you're turning the tables on others and in actually accusing them of being the ones who are perpetrating bad onto you. He continues here. Yes, John Collins is using the term public lynching about a white person being accused of racism. is quite extraordinary. Choose of words. Unless this is a linguistic nuance I'm missing. The quote in Spanish equals that meaning. Kala also continually referred to himself as a victim of a public lynching, which he claims again before offering his phone number so that those who have slander my image can apologize. <laughs> John Collins now insisting that he is not to he, he will not get in touch with Mukhtar Diakabi because I have no charge to be from the beginning and the claims that he is not his rules out taking any action against so and he claims he's not ruling out any taking any action legal action against the akabi insane Juan Kala insisting that he is supportive of the fight against racism whilst also claiming repeatedly that there is no racism in Spanish football. <laughs> Regardless of what happened on Sunday, those claims may be seen as somewhat contradict contradictory, which kind of leads me to the point of where we're at now at the moment, right? It does seem to be a thing in Spain or in those kind of countries, and you just see a video of him um, talking, I guess, and you know, speaking. It's totally false. It's a circus media that I've been suffering for a few days. Let's, let's put this point on me, but it's interesting in it approach that you see kind of um, of viewpoint on racism a lot in European places, especially in football, where they view it as just um, a fair ground in terms of kind of getting under the player's skin. They're basically arguing the point where they're so past seeing color that they're using it as an opportunity to kind of wind up their opponent and give them the sort of tactical edge and you know competitive edge when they're on the pitch by saying something that'll get under your skin you'll react to it you might you know leave your foot in leg get a second yellow card or whatever maybe you'll have to get subbed because you're a bit too hot-headed which is insane to think and it's just a very odd way to kind of view racism in that regard but it does explain why they feel that they justify to go into a stadium and throw a banana at a player that happens to be black do you know what i mean it's just maddening maddening beyond belief um of course more often than not nothing will really transpire from this um you know Juan Carlos will probably get away with it with a light fine the Akabi will have to just get over it and move on really because we've never really seen any real hard sanctions come down upon any of these European sides that are involved in these sort of issues especially in places like Spain right it's just not going to happen I don't really see it happening it's definitely something that's kind of institutional um something that's that's, that's system that's systemic whether they made that word is right and ingrained in their you know cultural identity it's very difficult to get those things to rid those things things from their you know lexicon and their viewpoint and it's just maybe a course of maybe over time naturally those kind of views will basically die out in terms of their, it being something that's sort of like uttered by a majority of people but in terms of there being some real change in the immediate future i don't really see it it's unfortunate again unfortunate to see i'm sure if you're the Akabi and you're just playing football uh, alongside your other ex your other pros on that same level the last thing you expect is for some of them to subject you to such abuse but i guess that's the nature of the game in it i guess that's the nature of the game but yeah utterly utterly insane <laughs> place to be in the world where this is happening next on the list what else do we have here where we have this funny thing have you have you seen this weird not weird but there's this trend i guess going on at the moment now within parts of london where kids are deciding to turn rollerblading no roller, roller skating not rollerblading roller skating actually rollerblading is actually a little bit cooler than this but supposedly this turning roller skating into this like fun extracurricular activity where they all go to some areas and 
on their skates and start listening to music and skating backwards and stuff and it's just so lame it's maybe one of the lamest things i've ever seen in a very very long time and this is a video of some kid that decided to i don't know put his roller skates on decide to tear down some street backwards i said that's impressive and again i i, I don't see what's so like um i really don't see what's impressive about this at all zero i was like Roller skating backwards isn't that difficult, especially when you've got skates on with four wheels at the bottom of you, right? It's quite possibly the easiest form of skating. If it was rollerblading, fair enough, right? There is something quite skillful about being able to balance on one set of wheels underneath the center of your mass of one foot. But having four very chunky wheels are so, you know, clipped onto the bottom of your shoe and being able to skate backwards doing it is not that impressive personally for me it's not a trick it's not cool and you see loads of images of people out there on the street with their little headphones in roller skating backwards on streets and stuff and doing nonsense tricks like splits or whatever it's just i don't know man it's just so lame it really is the lamest thing i've seen in my life and there's nothing like i would i would give my left nut to have these people just pick up a skateboard instead or like a really cool bike right that would be so much cooler to see these kids skating doing this thing like on like i said on actual rollerblades but this roller skate this roller skating thing is odd like what's happened is this like a resurgence or is this a signal that the 80s is making some sort of weird comeback or whatever it may be like what is going on why are all these kids out here roller skating someone explain to me like why is this a situation why does this make sense and like carrying these clunky things i guess there's carrying these clunky things and then i see, seen a guy recently the other day like you know skating somewhere i guess to go meet his friends and he had his shoes he's gonna wear normally right a pair of jordans and he's got his little thing on and he's you know skipping down the street and shit and you're just like Ugh. i don't know man there's there's nothing about this that i would want to do right like actively be happy to do like it just sounds like the most lame thing i can never imagine but this is the, the this is the odd thing in it this younger generation of kids are like not that interested in sports so if they get if this is the only way they're going to get out there and do some sort of physical activity you know recreationally then i guess that's a benefit you know going out there and sort of um navigating and you know kind of living out in the real world and you know using their surroundings as a playground and all that sort of malarkey but god damn it it looks lame in it it looks so lame there's nothing about it that looks cool whatsoever but you know say la vie i guess isn't it say la vie next on the docket we have this really funny interview with russ on the zz mill show i'm gonna say right is this it yeah the zz mill show where he basically details that somehow within his musical journey he somehow got himself into a deal where he signed for 20 was it he signed a deal for for 60,000 um but then in exchange he had to give his record label 24 albums because you know most likely and if when you when you sign a 360 deal from what we've heard so far from other artists the 360 deal usually encompasses like every kind of part of your earning potential right from st album streams to appearances to t-shirt and merch and stuff and usually a condition of one of those deals where you get kind of a bit of money up front like a loan in order to kind of secure your signature and also to kind of allow you to make music buy bits whatever it may be right um they usually have a a, a term in their stipulation that basically says this deal is basically basically for an x amount of albums and i guess the the clever bit with record labels why they say albums instead of singles is because it guarantees that whatever definition of albums they have whether it's 10 plus records it means that they're going to get sort of 10 plus songs it means that they're going to have to get a project that contains 10 plus songs from you before you can get out of your deal so it kind of locks you in place and most artists especially ones that have any kind of fit, you know artistic integrity it takes them probably more than a year to put one album together you maybe let's let's be you know let's be kind of um let's be loose with it and say 18 months in between albums so usually if someone signs a five album deal it's kind of a long deal that they're signing right it's probably going on to about 10 years before they can kind of get back to the negotiation table and maybe renegotiate or maybe look to buy themselves out or go to sign with somebody else so nowadays especially with the information that we have available out there people you know screaming even um russ's namesake the american russ talking consistently constantly about you know having to you know how you get how to 
make sure you don't sign a bad deal having um you know what's that thing called business literacy literacy or i don't really have one i'm speaking at the moment but being able to hire a business manager having somebody to come and look over your contracts not getting not using the same lawyer that a record label has because of course it's going to be a conflict of interest loads of things involved with it um but basically there's all that information's out there in the open you only have to kind of watch a few interviews of the breakfast club to kind of get an idea or what you should and shouldn't sign and how you should go into a record label deal so they really Really should be no sympathy being kind of lended to Russ's situation because he knowingly went and did it but I think the story and how he kind of talks about how he ended up in that situation makes it a lot more um makes it a lot more forgiving in that respect with you that if that makes any sense and I guess this is another aspect as to why it's so important as to how you I won't say address things but how you basically deal with things on social probably has a lot more to do with somehow your long-term kind of possibility of success in this game in general than your actual ability to make good songs and the fact that this guy can be a little bit self-deprecating um can obviously laugh at himself and doesn't mind participating in a meme it's probably going to account for him staying around longer in the scene than people that are far more talented than him that's got, that's basically my adage on this. So let's play a bit of the clip now and you can hear what he has to say about the whole deal. Right. Got a million views on the video. Then press play. Danny and Marcia and that, them man. They offered me a contract. In my head, I thought this was for like, <laughs> songs or something, and it ended up being for like 24 albums or something <laughs> stupid. Like <that. laughs> what? I swear to God, that like, 24 albums. So I'm breezy like that. So basically, I'm fresh <laughs> off the road. Like, I'm still out here trying to do whatever I'm trying to do. I'm Wait, hearing... so they, they signed you for 24 albums? Yes. Yeah. That's what, obviously, the back bit or the little small, small print or whatever. That little black see, bit. That's what was there. Innit? So you didn't get anyone to read the contract? No. I was gassed. I just come off the road. I'm thinking, what? 30, basically, they offered me 60 bags. I'm thinking, what? For me to be rapping out of what, what, what shit that man does in that? And I was thinking, cool. Do you think that happens to a lot of artists that uh, these people take advantage of them? Of no, I wouldn't say it's taking advantage. The way I thought of it is, I'm out here, man's trapping in that. Well, I'm not even the big trapper, I'm a meaty trapper. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not like, it's not like my new boxes there. And then I'm thinking, hold on, like, cool. Someone's offered me 60 bags, but these times a man's got a, a friend, innit? A duo, when you, innit? That's when you, innit? So cool. I'm thinking, Cool, you lot offered me 60 bags, but what about man, man? Like, that's kind of sneaky. I said, cool, give us 30 each, innit? They was on it. I said, cool. Told my mum and that, told his mum, linked up. Imagine how happy that label was when he came back to the negotiation table and say, I want 30 each for me and my friend. They must look to each other, kicked each other on the table like, is this guy fucking retarded? They must have been so happy. <laughs> Paperwork, got it. I was gas signed it off, gave back the, I was got the peas and that, you get me, gas. <laughs> bought a car, I bought a car the next day, I was Jesus gassed. Christ. No, I'm capping, not the next day. As soon as the peas the piece landed, I bought the car the next day. Right. Gassed, out here. Giving all my ups verbal. You know, I broke. <laughs> there, there, there. There, 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 out here, there. <laughs> then after, what happened after that? So cool. Press. Wait, oh, can yeah. Can so you, when did you find out it was 24 albums? <laughs> that, recently. <laughs> <laughs> not, not them time. <laughs> that. Definitely within like the last eight months or something. What? This yeah, guy's yeah, a legend, bro. This guy's now. a legend. So we'll get into that anyway. Okay. We'll get into wow. that. So cool now, boom. Cool, that's all sweet. But surely, especially if you're in the music game now, surely financial literacy has to be at the front of your mind, especially just from almost understanding your business, especially when it comes to specking out how you sort of lay out your career. But again, it's not, you know, it's not something that you should expect from all people. And there is something quite admirable to the fact that he is, you know, very open and upfront as to how much of a dunce he was and how much of a dummy he was and kind of, you know, open up to the fact that, hey, it wasn't that they kind of hoodwinked him into signing the shitty deal. It's the fact that he was in such dire straits prior to signing it. He didn't mind if they even, I'm sure he would have taken 10 grand or 20 grand at the time. If you're going to take 30 each for, you know, having a, a song with a million hits on on flipping YouTube, he would definitely have taken 10 grand. He's basically saying that I was in such dire straits. I was just looking for any way out that wouldn't involve me having to be on the roads, you know, selling, you know, crack from the, crack of my flipping ass and he got given a way out and he basically snatched it and all in all again maybe he's not you know where he should be and his conscious situation might not, might not be where it should be in terms of business wise but in terms of the the difference and in terms of where he could have been if he didn't sign that deal 
this is still far out far outweighs having to be on the streets and doing whatever he was doing on road in it so there is still kind of a silver lining in the story but it is interesting to see that this is still happening nowadays after everything that's occurred after all the information we have out there all the free resources all the crazy stories that have been read over there and again this probably maybe is another um indication another kind of insight into you shouldn't just assume people know stuff just because you've seen it maybe all those interviews and reviews and op-eds and you know rants and people that have been going on maybe you just missed it right if you're really plugged into the streets and you're doing your bits you're probably not keeping up to date with the latest breakfast club interview you're probably not caring what someone says on the fader magazine you don't give a crap right you're just doing your thing and keeping it moving you're definitely listening to podcasts i would assume right selling on road and being yeah i would, I would assume going on road and being on your bike and stuff you're not kind of tuning into podcasts and finding out what someone has to say about you know the ups and downs of their career you're just doing your thing so those labels can definitely pry on that and take advantage of this and going forward but god damn it man what a what an incredibly bad deal maybe the worst i've heard in a while because you hear about these bad deals from people that signed ones prior to the internet or prior to social media being the thing but to hear somebody like within this era right somebody that's current and somebody that kind of popped in the, within the last few years having to sign such a crappy deal knowing how much they could have for sure like if he just would have just you know from what i know f about youtube numbers if he was able to replicate um that hit that got a million views a few more times and maybe sign a couple of distribution deals and get his stuff on TuneCore, he probably would have been able to clear sixty thousand in a year himself without any assistance without any loans or anything you probably were to do that but again that would have required having to know how to upload things where to go it's just it's a whole infrastructure he probably has no idea what to do so for sure the label you know were able to present hey we've got a manager for you we've got somebody who can do the videos right they give you a package that just makes sense especially if you're somebody that has no idea how the industry works you just want to perform your songs to keep it moving but god damn man 60 grand for 24 albums is probably one of the worst deals i've heard in a long time but hey at least he's able to laugh at it at least he's able to laugh at it anyway that was the excellent single show episode number four five no four four six sorry thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's your first time checking out the show make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe leave a comment down below and if you're listening via the podcast app a five star review will help it to go a long way please share and review it on there please if you can that'll help it to get you know pops up on the algorithm and all that good stuff and then i'll see you guys again very very soon until then take care be safe peace